there was a drive through convenience store. It gets better. So I go there and I take a nose hair trimmer and it's a black nose hair trimmer and I paint the center of it even blacker so it looks like a gun and I put it in my sleeve and I have a bandana around my, my neck right here and I pull up to the drive through and the person opens up the sliding glass window and I pull the bandana up and I go, you know what it is. What's up, guys, and welcome back to the Locked In with the Inbic podcast. I have an exciting episode for you today. I have Robert Chiosi here to share his entertaining story of how he committed not one, not two, but three robberies at the same location with a nose trimmer. That's right. You heard correctly. He robbed the same place three times with a nose trimmer. In this episode, we find out how those robberies went down how he ultimately got caught, and how he got sentenced to a lengthy prison sentence. And then we also get to hear how he turned it all around and became a successful author. I need to give a big thanks to our new sponsor, Cheech and Chong's Cruise Chews for supporting Locked In. I got to try Cheech and Chong's Cruise Chews for the first time the other day, and I absolutely love them, and I highly recommend you guys give them a try too. Go try them at cruisechews.com slash locked in for 30% off your order. Again, that's cruisechews.com slash locked in for 30% off your order. There will be a direct link in the description of this episode that'll help get you there faster. Thanks again to Cheech and Chong for sponsoring today's episode. Now let's get into today's episode with Robert Chiosi. You know, there's a lot of New Jersey people that come on the show. I had a guy yesterday from New Jersey. Uh, he was in an Ecuadorian prison for seven years for smuggling. He got caught. <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, well, we we uh, we definitely pride on se- ourselves on how many criminals we have in New Jersey. You know, that's a yeah, that's something we're definitely acclaimed to fame. Where in New Jersey no. are you? So I'm in uh, I'm in the suburbs. You know, okay. not too far. I'm near uh, a town called Wayne. Pompton Plains is the name of the town that I grew up in, mm-hmm. and and that's essentially where I did my crime. <laughs> I moved to Florida for a long time, and I, I fell into the whole opioid epidemic down in Florida because that was like pill mill capital of the world. But when I got sentenced to prison, I ended up in a place called Northern State Prison, which is in Newark, New Jersey, total uh, gang prison. I thought they were sending me to the Thunderdome. I'm like, what? I'm like, are you sure you want to send me there? Because I'm— I was as about as uh, green as they come. Yeah, I'm actually familiar with the Wayne area because I used oh, to work for Whole Foods, and they opened a lot of stores in New Jersey, so I would help out. Um, the recent one was in Wayne. That was a couple of years ago, I think, Wayne. But there was another one um, that I was out there for. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there. I'm right in, in the Wayne. Area. I'm one town over from Wayne. Awesome. So, Have yeah. you, are you familiar with Larry Lawton at all? Larry Lawton was my freaking cellmate. Wait, Larry Lawton was? Black Larry Lawton? No, no, oh. white guy. He's the jewel thief. The jewel yeah, thief. Yeah, you look like a, a younger Larry Lawton. He was like this I notorious. I don't know him, but I had a celly named Larry Lawton. A small for, world. Yeah. yeah, you got to check him out. He's got a huge YouTube. He does interviews. He was on our show. He's got, yeah, like 1.5 million subscribers on YouTube. Um, definitely check that out. Oh, I got to check that yeah, out. Yeah, he wrote well, a book, too. I won't forget too. the name. Yeah, and you're, and you're an author, too. You, you gifted us these uh, amazing books. Uh, if you want to tell the audience where they can purchase books yeah, like so, this. Yeah, so um, I write under a different name. I run write under the pen name Damon Manx. And uh, y- you can find some of my books at Barnes & Noble. Okay. You can, yeah, we've got <laughs> stickers and everything, bookmarks. I also have my own publishing company. Um, so if you wanted to check me out, um, you could go to Damon Manx. That's spelled D-A-E-M-O-N-M-A-N-X at Amazon can look me up there. All my books are there. A lot of them are on Kindle Unlimited, where you could get ebooks for free. I also sell signed copies uh, through my publishing company, which is Last Waltz Publishing. So you'd go to www.lastwaltzpublishing.com. 
And I have a big series coming out this year, so I'm doing like a five state book tour coming oh, up. Yeah, not probably a lot of podcasts. I've been doing quite a few podcasts, <laughs> and, and I'm sure there's funny. more to come. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping so. Yeah. I, I think after people see this, you'll get a lot of um, reach out. Usually, that's how things work. Uh, people see an episode, and then you know, because I like breach the surface of someone's episode, because I like to go beginning, middle, end, and then other podcasts find that episode and they're, they want to expand on that because mm. there's only so much you could talk about within the hour, hour and a half, you know? Um, it, some people like to go for three or four hours. I can't personally do that. <laughs> that would be a lot. That would be a lot. And it would be so hard to tell everyone's story in that capacity, you know, three times a week. Um, and I don't think we would experience the growth that we've had if we just did one episode a week. And there's so many people that want to share their story. Yeah, I've noticed that. I, I As soon as I found out about you, and I found out about you through a uh, a literary agent who I, I work with, a guy who works out in New York and has a lot of larger names, much bigger than myself. And he's like, you got you got to check out Locked In with Ian Bick because he's all about, you know, the story of those returning from prison because it's not just, you know, it's not just the hardened criminal. It's not just the gangbanger. I mean— it's your brother, it's your husband, you know, one in 10 people end up in the prison system in some way in the United States. And, and I think it's a great thing what you're doing is allowing, allowing us to tell our stories because there is life after prison. Yeah, there. absolutely. And it's not the same celebrity story that right. everyone hears about. So it, it makes it interesting. Yeah, I think it's a great thing you're doing, man. I've, <laughs> I, you, I'm man. so happy that you l allowed me to be on the show. Of course, that's what we're all about. Yeah. So you grew up in uh, New Jersey, that Wayne area you were talking about. Yeah. What was that like? Did you have big family, uh, both parents, siblings? I, I have one sister. You know, I grew up in a house with just, you know, the mom and the dad, the family unit. Um, and there was no, you know, it was a normal family. Suburbs relatively, um, not pretty close to Patterson. So we were close to, you know, the element where we could get in trouble if we wanted to. And I was certainly always looking to get in trouble, but the family dynamic was, you know, n very, very old school, you know, go to church on Sunday, celebrate the, uh, the holidays together, um, with the large family, with the aunts and the uncles and the cousins. And it wasn't until, you know, much later that I found a different way that I wanted to pursue, you know. <laughs> I was definitely into everything, you know. People were ever like, oh, don't be hanging out with Robert. He's into everything. I, I was that kid who was like pretty much wanted to always try, always push the envelope. You know. Did you guys come from money? Were you guys well off, middle class? You know, I always thought that we had money, but no, we weren't. We we had like, a, whatever, a bi-level house, you know. I guess it's all comparative, but we were middle class. Um, so, you know, we we went on one vacation a year, and that was usually to the Jersey Shore, where we would spend a week down there. But my father worked every day, and my mother, you know, she had her part-time job. So at the time, you know, I guess comparatively— we were no better or no worse than anybody else that we were growing up in. But, I mean, if you were to look at Pompton Plains, New Jersey, you would might – now people would say, oh, yeah, you had money. But, well, we lived in a flood zone. You know, we got flooded once every five years. So it wasn't like we were rolling in it. It wasn't mm -hmm. like I could ask for something and I would get that. Yeah. I, I had to – I had my first job when I was 14 years old. Where was that? So my first job, there was a lake called Cressmere Lake that was right across the highway. And people would come from out of town and, and go to the lake for the day. And for $2 an hour, I would go there in the morning and skim the moss off the pond. And then at the end of the day, I would pick up the cigarette butts and the garbage and load it into the dumpsters and clean, clean up now, the, the that, mess. That $2 an hour, though, could actually buy you some stuff, right? Like I, my dad tells me stories about how you could go to the movies back in the day, you know, 50 cents, you're getting a, a ticket, popcorn and, and a soda or something like that. Yeah. I, I imagine it could have, but like I was just spending it on like a bag of weed. You know, I was not, I was never smart with money. Yeah. I'm still not today, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, well, everyone's got their own personal yeah. preferences. I, I, I yeah. 
Now, high school, did you end up graduating? Uh, I did, by the skin of my teeth. So I was, again, I was that guy who was, I would much rather go out and party during the day. I, I cut so many classes during my sophomore year that they kicked me out sophomore year. Like, I, I had literally missed, like, 100 days by the time before graduation. And they're like, no, no, we're not going to do it. And I was, <laughs> yeah, I was with four other kids. And we were across the, across the street in, like, the church parking lot. And we were smoking something we shouldn't have been smoking. And the principal and the vice principal walked up on us, caught us out of nowhere, and on the spot, kicked those other three people out and told me, and I got kicked out as well. I was the only one who was allowed to come back the following year. And they were like, look, I remember sitting down with the vice principal. And he's like, you know what? You're just walking to the beat of your own drum. And he's like, this is not going to end well for you. Just trust me on this. And I knew everything, you know. You're 15 years old. You uh, you know. Yeah, I, every, I know. Every, every kid's like that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, I I nah, I'm going to I'm going to make it. I'm going to do what I can. So he let me come back in. He arranged it so that I could do all my schoolwork in like 3 hours and then leave and go work, which is all I wanted to do. So I was working at a cabinet shop at that point trying to learn the trade and uh, so I would go to high school for like those last 2 years take gym, my English, my math, and do it all in like a three-hour pop and then leave at lunchtime and uh, go to work at the cabinet shop for the rest of the day. And that was enough that, that was enough time to keep me in there <laughs> to allow me to graduate, and that's how I ended up graduating high school. Did you have a close relationship with your parents during those years? Um, with my mom more so. My father was, by that point, he was kind of distancing himself from, you know, they, they ended up getting divorced. So I don't know if I contributed to that, having a little bit of a problem child at the time, but um, they were separating. So I wasn't really close with my father at the time. I was closer with my mother. When you look back on it now, do you think the divorce affected you to maybe do certain things or, or go down the route that you chose? You know, I, I would think I, when I look back at it now, I feel more guilty that I affected the divorce. And that could be, you know, just our own guilty feelings, you know, looking back on things. We always think it's our fault. Um, but I'm sure everything played into each other. Because um, as far as my memory goes, I don't, I don't see them having problems prior to me having problems. I always see my problems being the catalyst, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that divorce could have been predetermined years even before you were born. Well, you I never think it know. was. I don't yeah. think they really were all that meant to be together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so do you go off to college? You know, I didn't do college until I got into prison. So uh, prison was your college? Prison was my exactly college. Exactly like in, me. <laughs> yeah. In, in a lot of ways, more than that. Like, I, I learned a lot by going to prison. So how do you, what, what is like a, de a defining moment where you go from high school or, you know, just maybe a little bit of trouble, like every kid, mm. and then all of a sudden you end up in a, in prison basically at a young age? Yeah. So, you know, like I, I, I did well, like I, I bought a house. I had a, I had the wife, I had the life, you know, I had a business. I was a she rocker. I had these, I had guys working for me. So I was doing well. And then we moved to Florida. Um, and there was a, a problem because once I moved to Florida, life was very different. My wife was working. I was having a hard time finding something that I felt comfortable in. And I was doing some handyman work down in Florida, and I ended up hurting my shoulder at one point. And the doctor, I allowed the doctor or manipulated the doctor into prescribing uh, Vicodin at the time, which I was just like, this was like the missing ingredient in my life. Um, and it just like the miracle drug made me feel just took away all the pain and, and kind of like hit, flipped the switch inside of me. Um, I, I was playing guitar with a friend and, and one day he said, Hey, you ever tried Oxycontin? I'm like, no, but you know, 
what do you got, you know? And he handed me this uh, pill that you had to scrape and snort and and it was off to the races, which, it, you know, everybody knows that and Oxy is, was synthetic heroin. And, uh, and that was it. Like, um, that just started the, my addiction just went boom. It was like the missing link in my addiction. And, and I chased it to the gates of insanity. I chased it to the point where my wife, uh, you know, couldn't recognize who I was, couldn't recognize myself, ended up in a divorce. You know, I ended up losing my business. We had to sell the house. I had to move back to New Jersey with my tail between my legs, but, you know, carried my addiction with me. And, and from there, it just got worse, you know. But in New Jersey, there was no Oxycontin anymore. There was heroin, which was even easier to get and uh, a whole lot more potent. Why did you move to Florida to begin with? You know, we were living in uh, Saddlebrook, New Jersey. We had a house and it was at the housing boom. So we made made a lot of money on the house. And uh, and my wife was working in New York on 9-11. And uh, some of the people that she actually worked with were had to go down to work at another site that day. That site was in the Twin Towers. So some of the people who got sent from her building to go work in the Twin Towers did not come back after that. Um, that affected her a lot. And being that close to it, we were like, well, maybe we should get out of this area. And so we decided to sell the house because it was a good time to sell the house. Went down, moved to Florida, built a house of uh, something, a dream home, you know. And uh, we were going to start this whole new life. And um, while it didn't work out quite quite as planned, you know. Do you think if you'd never injured yourself, you'd still be living in Florida now and have the dream house with the wife and everything? I, 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 I don't think so. Because I, like you said, maybe that marriage was preordained not to make it. I think that was kind of the way that marriage was too. Um, I think my problem with addiction was going to come out regardless of geographic location. I, I think it's always been in me and it's something that I had never addressed because, you know, prior to that it was, it was dabbling. It was the drinking. It was, you know, it was smoking weed or it was doing coke or, or whatever. It was always something. And I think had it never reached its head, reached critical mass, I never would have addressed it. Even without the injury? Because don't you think the injury put a little bit of a gas on that fire that was like building within you? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think it did put the gas on the fire, but I think maybe it just sped up the the explosion. Yeah, it's, it's so like I'm fascinated with how one cause affects everything else. Like just one little thing, because I look at my story and there was one individual defining moment that said everything. And it's so common in all of the stories we hear that it's, it's, you know, it's one thing. And then people argue, well, it's not one thing. It's a buildup and this and that. But it's one thing that triggers everything that falls afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's always a match that lights the keg of dynamite, right? You know? Yeah. I guess it's like, how do we prevent those matches from going off? You yeah. Know? And, and I think without knowledge, you know, without the knowledge of what it's like to be caught in that explosion, you really don't know how to prevent it from happening. Yeah, I guess it's just looking at the warning signs. So that way you could kind of dampen out, you know, put a stop to that gas leak before it, it explodes. Well, maybe if you can listen to people like you and me who have <laughs> been through it. But you know what? I've heard stories from, from guys like myself who were like, you know, if this is what's going to happen. And I'm like, what do you know? You never think it happens to you, you. It'll never happen to me. Addiction won't happen to me. I'm not the kind of guy who goes to prison. Like everybody who I talk to, they're like, there's no way. You were in prison? I'm like, I did eight years in Northern State. Yeah, I did prison. Yeah. Wow. You, and that's what I tell people. I say, you know, it's not, it's not just your gangbanger. It's not just your heavy hitters. It's... It could be your brother. It could be your husband. It could be your kids. Yeah, you were so funny <laughs> when you came in today. You're like, I just want you to know I'm no gangbanger. Yeah, I am not. Like, I'm the dumbest criminal in the world. 
Let's just get that straight. I'm the dumbest criminal in the world. Would you like to hear more? Yeah. So <laughs> y- y- you get back to New Jersey. You're on to heroin now. Yeah. Oh, how old are you? Uh, 45. And what year is this? So this, let's say 2010 to, I get back in, in 2010. Oh, so you had like a seven, eight year run in Florida. Yeah. I, I had a good run with the, the oxys. Okay. Yep. So you're back in here now. You're divorced. You're on your own. You lost pretty much everything and you're returning. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm at desperate times here. So I'm returning and my addiction is still with me. You know, I, I tried a couple months of not doing anything and that didn't work. And I worked a couple jobs trying to make enough money to feed the addiction because now I know where to get heroin in, in New Jersey. And, uh, and that doesn't last longer either. So I'm borrowing money from everybody and I, I'm finding ways to manipulate money out of people. And I'm doing everything I can just to feed the addiction. And that's growing at ex, an exponential rate. And it's, uh, it's one of the hardest things to do to, to feed an addiction as, as it's growing out of control. And somehow I talk myself into the only logical way to feed this addiction is now to rob something, to rob a convenience store. And at the time that I'm telling myself this, this is making perfect sense. Like I know it's wrong. Like I know there's can be extreme consequences, but I'm still able to convince myself that this is the next logical step. So what I do is I take a, like I'm so, I'm embarrassed to say it, but you know, it's like, this is the insanity of addiction. There was a drive through convenience store. It gets better. So I go there and I take a nose hair trimmer and it's a black nose hair trimmer and I paint the center of it even blacker so it looks like a gun and I put it in my sleeve and I have a bandana around my, my neck right here and I pull up to the drive through and the person opens up the sliding glass window and I pull the bandana up and I go, you know what it is? And they, they're in shock like, and they just start opening up the cash drawer and putting all the money in a bag and hand it to me. And I'm like, I peel off. I go, have a nice day. And I run and like the adrenaline is pumping and, and I get away with it. And this, this is insanity. So of course, like I go right to Patterson to pick up a bunch of dope and, and spend the money. Now, this is where it gets, I'm the stupidest uh, criminal in the world. Not only did I do that once, I then went back and robbed the same place three times in a row. Wait, what? Yeah, yeah. You robbed the same place? Same way, same exact MO how every spread, time. How spread out were these? Uh, maybe two to three weeks apart. And how much money did you get? This is it. You're going to like, Dude, I've never heard you, anything like this. You know, of course not. <laughs> and, and to go to prison for being just like, you deserve to be in prison for being that stupid. Um, was it the same woman by chance? No, it was different every Imagine time. if it was the same woman. You would have the, the such, oh man. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you may not even air this episode. Oh, no, we have to, <laughs> man. This story is incredible. The so, same drive-thru. So the same drive-thru. Same car. A different car. Okay. For, so you weren't that dumb. I, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for saying so. Different color yeah. bandana? Yeah, different color bandana, okay. different different hat, you know. Okay, so you, you had a disguise. A little bit. Could have yeah. just been a coincidence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt today's show, guys, but I need to talk about our sponsor for this episode. And this is an interesting one, and just in time for 420. Today's episode, we're sponsored by Cheech and Chong. Yeah, that Cheech and Chong. And they're 100% legal THC gummies, cruise chews. 20 years ago, the DEA broke down his door and Tommy Chong went to prison for selling glass bongs. Now he and his longtime partner Cheech are the biggest names in legal THC edibles. That's right, Tommy Chong found himself in the same shoes many of those who listen to the show have been in, including myself. 
and I'm so excited to be partnered with them so that our listeners can enjoy their products just as much as I do. We've entered a new era where Cruise Chew's THC gummies are legal, so you could get them shipped directly to your door in every state except Idaho. You've probably seen Cheech and Chong ads online, and if you haven't tried them already, you might be wondering if they live up to the hype. Guys, I've gotten to try these firsthand, and I have to say, I love them. They're three milligrams of THC each, and it didn't take long for them to do the job. Not only did I feel relaxed, but I had one of the best nights of sleep after my first time trying them. I'm a huge advocate for using edibles to help relax, de-stress, and rest, and with how stressful my life is right now, I'm thankful to have Cheech and Chong's Cruise Chews to help me decompress after a long day. And it gets better. There are 30 gummies in a jar, and they taste great too. If you're looking for something to help mellow you out, head to trycruisechews.com slash locked in and get an extra 30% off their already low prices. That's try C-R-U-I-S-E-C-H-E-W-S dot com slash locked in. Now let's get back into my episode with Robert Chiosi. So, you know, I do that <laughs> and it's like spread two or three weeks apart, you know, and well, you know, the first one was a big hit. I got five hundred dollars. Oh man! Yeah, yeah. The, the second one was a little less. I think I got about three. And then, uh, you know, the second one it was much less than that because they knew they they they're like, watch out for this guy. So you got a thousand dollars total, uh, at most. Yeah, yeah. But you know, like, if if anybody's listening, who's who doesn't think that addiction could do that to you? Like I heard those stories, like oh, you'll rob your own mother, you'll you'll take stuff out of your purse, and I'm like, get the hell out of here! That'll never happen. That shit just changed me, and that's not who I am. That's never who I was. I was never that guy, and that just turned me into somebody else. Wow. Yeah. Um. So because you used a nose trimmer, that made it armed robbery, right? Yeah. So there's this, uh, the NERA Act is, it, it, it's no early release. So that was the sentencing guideline. If you have a gun or you pretend you have a gun, it's intent to do bodily harm. So it doesn't matter if the cops roll up, whether they think you got a gun or a nose hair or your hand in your pocket— it's intent. Yeah, they would still have to draw their weapon and fire on you if they felt like you were going to draw first. Yeah, and that's in the federal system too where even if you say you have a gun but don't, it's right. still that enhancement because I've learned like there was robbers in federal prison that like did huge bank heists that got less time than the armed ones because all they would do is go in, pass a note, and just say, hey, give me the money, and the banks are required to give them the money because that's the protocol or whatever. Um, but they got significantly less time for that compared to the same person that walked in that got the same amount of money with a gun. Right. Or a weapon or said they had a weapon. Yeah, I knew nothing about it. <laughs> so how do you get caught then? So, you know, the the first time that I, I had worked for a company and I still had a, a key to their garage. So the first two times that I did that, I went into that garage and took one of the company trucks out and used the company truck to do the robbery. I wasn't using my own vehicle. And, uh, you know, they couldn't figure out who, who it was, you know. And finally, you know, they're trying to piece it together. And they're like, they want to question me because the, the owner of the company said, well, you know, it could have been this guy or it could have been this guy. So they're questioning all people who had worked for the company. And they get me in finally on one day, and it's the day that Hurricane Sandy hit in 2012. And uh, and and I'm dope sick at this point, and I'm I'm like I'm tired, like I'm tired of everything. I'm I had you know tried to unalive myself prior to this, and like I was ready, I was ready for it to be over, you know, no matter what. Like I was done. Using, I couldn't go another day using heroin. I couldn't go another day without it. And uh, they get me in there, and I lasted about an hour of their questioning. And then I folded like a patio furniture. I just told them everything. Again, 
stupid. You never do that, you know. But I, I just told on myself, like, I gave them everything they wanted to know. I gave them enough to put me away. Do you think that if you had an attorney present or even just didn't talk to them, they would have had enough still to figure it out who was you? So when I finally got a pool attorney, you know, I, the uh, dis, the public defender, I got a pool attorney. He comes in. He goes, you know, I'm listening to the tape. He goes, you know, if you just kept your mouth shut another hour longer, they had nothing on you. I'm like, should I get an attorney? <laughs> yeah. I, I, and by then it was too late because I had given them enough information, you know. Um, but had I kept my mouth shut, they they wouldn't have been able to charge me. Um, I wouldn't have gone to prison or I wouldn't have gone to county jail that day. And uh, I'd probably be dead because I would have overdosed or, or done something. Yeah. Other, something stupid. Yeah, that was an integral part of your own healing journey and, and recovery by getting caught. It had to happen that way. You know what? I, I had to have a significant enough change, a a catalyst, a rock bottom, as they say. And even that, like even getting arrested and thrown in county jail, those first two weeks of being there wasn't enough rock bottom. I get thrown into county jail and I'm dope sick and you get better. So like the first thing they do is they're like, you know, uh, the stupidity just continues here. So the first thing they'll ask you is, you know, do you feel like hurting yourself or somebody else? And like, I wanted to hurt myself bad. So I'm like, hell yeah. Mistake. So I get thrown into solitaire wearing the burlap poncho in this freezing cell while I'm dope sick. You know, and that's for like a week just to make sure I won't hurt myself. And uh, and that's still not enough. So I get out of there and, and the male nurse comes in and I'm like, you know, hey, man, I'm I'm really sick. Can you give me something to help me through it? And he's like, nah, we, we like to bring you down like a spaceship, hard, hot, and fast. <laughs> <laughs> like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, I've heard from a lot of people that come on the show how awful that is. Um, being dope sick and, and just going through withdrawal in prison, especially in like a county jail where they're not equipped for it. They don't have the proper medicine for you. And it's just litter. And I've been in cells with guys that have been picked up from court or whatever, their bond revoked or no bail. And it's just, they're miserable. It's really bad. Yeah. But you know, a couple of weeks, a week or two, you get over it. Honestly, but my sleeping didn't come back for about 40 days where I didn't really get a good night's sleep or much of any sleep for almost a month. But the real rock bottom, you know, where I'm like, this is enough. So I'm about two weeks into my county jail uh, stint, and and I get a job in the kitchen. And very quickly do I rise in the ranks, and I'm working in the ODR. I'm working, serving the officers, and I'm cooking, and I'm eating good food, and I'm, I feel like I'm balling. And I look around and I'm like, you know what? I got all the ingredients to make hooch. <laughs> so where do I do? I take five gallon bucket and I put all the ingredients together and I hide that bucket inside the tray machine in the bottom where it's really hot. So it'll cook it. And I figure, you know, Christmas is coming. I'll just sneak it back up onto the tier and we'll have a big party. I'll be the hero of the tier. I got caught like two days later cooking the this huge batch of hooch and I get thrown in the hole and I'm in the hole on Christmas. And there's nothing in that hole but a couple pieces of paper and one of them is about recovery and I'm like avoiding that piece of paper and it's Christmas Eve and I'm looking out the little tiny window and the chaplain comes on and he's got bags of like candy and deodorants and and T-shirts that he's given out to all the guys, except for the guys on the tier. And I'm like, you know, at this point, my my family will not talk to me because I, I can't be trusted, and I'm a, you know, I'm a scumbag, you know. I don't have any friends who are contacting me. I'm in there alone. They're throwing these football numbers at me like 25 years for the, the three robberies that I've done, 
and I'm looking at, and these guys are eating candy, and I have nothing in the cell, man. And yeah, man, I cried like a little baby, man. I was, uh, you know what? This is like, this is my life. I'm like, this cannot, I can't end up like this. And I'm like, you know what? Right here, it changes. And that that was the moment where I said, you know what? You cannot be the same man who walks out of this place, the same man who who went in. And I made a clear and conscious decision to change everything about myself. At that point right there. At that point right there. So you didn't even need to do the eight years that was to come. They could have given me two and it would have been more than enough. (laughs) They could have gave you a pass (laughs) and let you go. Yeah. But you know what? The The eight was just like a reaffirming. I know, but you didn't need to do eight years. And, and everybody's like, man, they smacked you. Because a lot, you know, if it wasn't, I, I gave the the prosecutor a, a slam dunk first degree uh, conviction. I all, gave it to him. All that you know? aside, though, do you think that they, the court and the prosecutor ever took a chance to understand who you were before n- the robbery? No. Not, like what led you to addiction? No. And there was, they were doing things called drug court. If you had like a second or a third degree offense, which almost could have, I could have almost gotten kicked down if I didn't give them the slam dunk. And the only time that they even considered it. um, So by the time I go to sentencing, I've done 18 months in the county jail. Because you got no bail. No bail. Or it was like $150,000 and nobody has money to help me and nobody's going to take a chance on me either. But by this time now, I have 18 months clean and sober. I'm actually thinking clearly. I'm going to every possible meeting I can to help myself while in the county jail. And I'm even helping other guys who are in there, you know. And the judge is like, all right, you know, so I finally sign a 12 with an 85. And uh, the prosecute the public public defender he's like you know what you're going to get your chance to talk and when you get the chance to talk if the judge likes what you have to say you might get a little less he's like well you're not going to get much less but you might get a little and the judge judge gilson he says well mr kiosi do you have anything that you'd like to add this is your chance to talk and i get up and i in my orange jumpsuit and i'm like yeah i go you know i i know i have to do time you know, I, I can't take back what I did. I, I'm extremely sorry for what I did. I'm extremely sorry for the time that I'm taking away from my family because that's where the real the punishment is. I'm I've punished the ones I love, and I've punished the community, and I've punished you know I've I've hurt the people who who were at that convenience store you know emotionally and and psychologically, you know, and I can never take that back. What I have been doing is making sure that I'm not going to be that same person when I walk out of here. And, and I know I have to do this time, but, uh, you know, I, I've been working on recovery and I hope that one day my story helps maybe somebody else. And the, the judge looks at me and he goes, I can tell the bullshit when I hear it. He goes, I believe every word you say. He goes, you signed a 12. Unfortunately, you got to do some time I'm going to sentence you to 10 within 85. You have to do eight and a half years. And he goes, if you can help one person while you're down, maybe this will all have been worth it. And to me, that felt like a a generous gift, you know? Wow. It's... I still think it's fucked. I do too. I mean, it's it's a lot of time and I think I would have... I mean, that's where the system g- fails. It did, you know. I would have got the message... I don't think I would have got the message with a 364, you know, or, or a year and a half. But I, I think three years would have would have really made its point. Eight eight was excessive. I really hope the the people that are, you know, responsible for the changes listen to things like this. Well, or, or one day someone that has some power will, you know, like because people ask me, like, are you in reform? Are you in what do you do? Like, are you in that space? And I look around and I realize, like, a lot of these advocates or whatever, like, they they say a lot and they do the same things. And, you know, that's great. That's what they're passionate about. But are they really necessarily moving the needle uh, of it to make the changes? And, and someone like me, I think my responsibility falls in not to go and 
preach to a senator or say whatever. It's just to get these stories out there so the world could see it. And then like those stories can go viral and they can get views so the people can vote the right people into office to make those changes. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think I think all phases of it help, but I think, you know, what you're doing here helps a lot more. You know, you got to show that these people, the men and women who go to prison are, are, are people too. You know, they're not just, it's not just the hardened criminal out there who, you know, leads a life of crime from the day they're conceived to the day they die. You know, it's, it's everyday people who, who make mistakes and we all make mistakes. Some of them, some of us make far grander mistakes than others. But, you know, I think telling the story, showing the human side and also talking about, you know, what we do after the fact, because so I, when I got into the county jail, like I thought it was over and there was a guy who'd been through the system a bunch, Joaquil. I remember this very clearly. He goes to me, he goes, you know, this is not the end. He goes, there, there, is, there is a life after this. He goes, you're going to do your time and you're going to get out and you will have a life after this. And that resonated because there was a life after prison and my life is so much better now. Um, but but prison was a a big part of my transformation into turning it all around. So you got the eight and a half, so you basically have to do like seven because you already did that time in the county. Yeah, well, I did, yeah. So I, I got eight and a half and I, you take eight, uh, 18 months off, take a year and a half off of that. So essentially I had to do seven. And while I was in there, so while I, I did the like six of it in the state prison and then it's time to go to the halfway house and then COVID hit while I was in the halfway house. I'm sure that's a whole nother. Dude, we could go on for another hour about that. <laughs> so you got the seven, but they you're not allowed to stay at the county. They move you. So you're out of your comfort zone into this new facility. What was day one like for you? So, yeah. So day one, I, well, first thing you get sent to like the, the craft or whatever, the central facilitation, and, and they determine where you're going to go. And they tell me I'm going to Northern State Prison in Newark, New Jersey. And I look at them like, are you out of your mind? You're sending me to the Thunderdome. Like that place is, it's, an, you go on the internet, you know, there, there's cages outside the cells. There, there's videos of when, when all, they took all the bloods and they put them all in these cages. And all of a sudden you hear the handcuffs just unclicking because the bloods have their own keys to the handcuffs. And, uh, you know, it, it's notorious for being a crazy ass prison. Um, so I, I said, well, fuck there, you know, we're, we're dead. Um, so they give me my, my work boots that have no insoles and my baggy clothes that don't fit and march me down to a unit. And I'm sent to the old head unit, you know, guys who got 30 to life who, you know, are in for bodies. So I'm like, well, now I'm, I'm scared shitless and I get 106 opens and I go to go in 106 and there's this giant guy with gold teeth, no shirt on, just his shorts, sprawled out on the bottom bunk. And I go to step in and he goes, whoa, my man, before you come in this cell, what are you in here for? My heart jumps into my throat. I'm like, armed robbery. He's like, that's a very respectable crime. Come on in, my friend. <laughs> yeah, he just wanted to make sure I wasn't a cholo, or you know. Do they call them chomos in the state Ch too? Yeah, chomo. And because you kind of because you're a white guy, no matter what, you you probably fit more of the part because you're older. Yeah, you know, I guess there you. That's the stereotype, or you know, you have that that white dude um, look who. Uh, but I never really got harassed or anything like I was taken in pretty pretty um pretty quickly you now know? was he curious about your like getting once he found out that you were fine and let you into the cell was he curious about what you did and did you tell him the whole story I told him the whole story and, and he loved it so his name was pork yeah well, that's what I called him <laughs> pork pork yeah he's a big guy really kind-hearted dude but he was you know he was a high-ranking Latin king um, 
And, you know, we bonded a little bit, but like right off, like that first day he goes, you know, just to tell you something's going down with the Kings, there's a chance we might get yanked out of this cell like in a day or two. So, you know, you know, just play it cool. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? That next morning, like at five in the morning, the cell opens and two giant guards come in barking, face down on the fucking bed. Don't fucking move. Put your hands behind your back. And they pull us out, bring us down to the interrogation area. They take pork one way, take me another way. And they're like, what do you know about the Kings? What did your bunkie tell you? I'm like, I don't know shit. You just got like, there. <laughs> I, even if I did know shit, I don't know shit. You know, I know enough. You don't, you never open your fucking mouth. And I just sit there, I, I hug the wall and they're like towering over me. They go, you know, we could, we could make your life easy here. We could get you a good job. You know, we could, you know, I'm like, I don't know nothing. You know, and then they put us, bring us back. You know, of course there's a strip search or whatever and, and take us out after a couple hours. And they let me, me and Pork go back, and they trashed our cell. And I guess they were looking for some kind of paperwork, or the the kings were beefing with somebody. So, you know, they were doing that to all the kings, and it was our time to go down there. And uh, we get back, and everybody's out, and we're sitting at the table, and it was one of his higher-ranking guys and a, a really older Italian dude who was a serious dude as well. And uh, we sit down at the table, and they're like, how did that go? And Pork goes, let me tell you something. He goes, my bunkie's the good dude. He just hugged that wall and kept his mouth shut like a champ. He goes, he's all right. If you guys need anything, or if he needs anything, please help him out. And from there, like, I, I, I didn't want for nothing. It was, I, I was in, you know. That's and, incredible. It was, it was, a, you know, and throughout that, like, I was just like, if I said I was going to do something, I did something. I was polite, you know, we had a good bond, you know, and, and for me, these older heads, you know, they're just living, they just want to live their lives and, you know, you know, that's their existence. So, you know, you respect one another and, you know, I, I fell in with some heavy hitters and, uh, they watched out for me and, and. Uh, they were also like enrolled in college, so I had a little bit of an education. So I was helping them with their math, helping them with writing essays. So it was just a, it was a different, it was a very different prison experience than most people have. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting how the dynamics are. You just do one thing for a complete random stranger, you earn their respect, and your that affects your whole prison stay because that could have went very differently. Like yeah. if you were trying to weasel your way out of it or anything, you were toast for for the rest of it. Yeah, that would have defined that would have defined the rest of my bid. Now that's a guy that was was in prison for mold, a very long time and still had a while to go. And he still has a while to go. He's still there now. Yeah, I, I stay in touch with a lot of uh, my guys I made friends with, and Pork has a couple years left. But you know, he was the thirty year that they give for a body. So what were uh, some of his cell rules, like his prison cell rules? Because we we hear from a lot of guys that go into cells where they're, you were just passing through. You mm -hmm. were a guest kind of in his home for a guy that's been there for so many years. Yeah, you know, I mean, Pork wasn't as militant on the, uh, you know, he was a little more lax, which was probably pretty cool. But, of course, you know, we, we'd hang the sheets when you're taking – Taking the number two or whatever, <laughs> definitely clean. You know, you you always got to keep the place clean. Um, what was him? I, I really, he he had a typewriter and he would always he was doing the paralegal stuff. So like I couldn't talk when he was doing that because he would always make mistakes. So there was no talking. Um, we we had a very respectful relationship. So I've I've heard some like you know militant guys who are like, oh, you gotta. When you go to the bathroom, you sit down to pee. Like it was nothing like that. Pork was pretty relaxed, and you know we were we were very much brothers in that cell. Um, so I, like I said, my my it's, my stay in prison was very different than a lot of people. I see a, on the topic of being different. I see a lot of like comments of 
people that are interested of like what would happen if they go to jail and you're someone that looks like you know you're a middle-aged guy went to prison could have been someone's father whatever did you have to like join a gang like what, what's the misconception because people just think like we you like you said coming into this mm. you're not one of those people so people automatically think that you have to be one of those people um, so like I get questions, did you have to join a gang, this and that? What was that like for you after that first cell experience? Did you have to join one? What are the dynamics? Are you asked? Are you approached? You know, I wasn't even asked, you know, when I was in the County, there were a lot of guys, you know, who, who, who were aligned with things that I didn't really want any part of, you know, uh, guys who claimed to be part of that area nation and, and, s- uh, state prison skinheads, which are, to me, was not my thing um, at all. And, you know, of course, the, the Latin kings and, and the bloods were looking to recruit a 45-year-old white dude. But I had no problem being friends with them, and, and they were definitely, you know, no problem being my friend. So I didn't have anyone uh, approaching me to be in a gang. I didn't walk into prison, pick out the biggest guy, and punch him in the face either. Because that's that will ruin your bid right there. <laughs> I guarantee that's the wrong thing to do. Uh, at least where I went. Do like, you think guys actually do that? I certainly hope not. Like, yeah, I'm sure you listen to the podcast, right? Like, yeah. you've you've heard people say that. Yeah, that's. I don't buy it for a second. <laughs> not for a hot fucking minute. No way. <laughs> like that. That wouldn't have worked out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, unless you like being in fucking ad sag you know yeah like i i think like if i did that in the feds you go up to some guy and you just hit him unless he started it with you i think it's a different scenario but if you just walk up just to start shit you're done and they're shipping your ass out of there they don't want any problems no wow yeah so i don't buy that i don't buy a lot of the stereotypical things that they say about prison so what was your job for those years did you end up getting a good job yeah well at first it was uh I volunteered to help redo the roof of the ED building, which was during August. So there was like 10 of us, um, and it's a flat roof, membrane roof with these heavy stones. So we're up there sweating and dying, and, and they aren't even paying us. They're just giving us like these awesome salads and tuna to eat. From, and uh, we're loving it, you know, because we're eating something different than the crap that they're they're serving and we're getting out of the cell but that only lasted like a couple weeks and then i uh i became a teacher's aide a teacher yeah what's the pay in prison uh in the state prison i I think i want to make it about 90 to 100 a month oh that's really good really good yeah i think it was yeah, I think about that. So you're able to live pretty good then as someone you're that didn't have outside help. Yeah. You didn't have outside help. Occasionally my mom, you know, okay. after a couple of years and my mom realized I, I was changing some things around, she'd send me in a couple bucks from time to time. Did she visit you? My mother never visited me. Did any family visit you, your sister? No. Uh, towards the end of my stay, my father came to visit me, but that was um, because my mother had passed away while I was in prison. Wow. Yeah. So... Uh, and he comes in and he he's hard of hearing. He's not wearing his headphones and we're in the gym and it's everybody screaming and he's like, he's whispering. It's like, I, I couldn't hear anything he was saying, but it was nice that he came in. But, and then my father and I actually developed a much better relationship afterwards. Do you wish that you had closure with your mom on the outside? Yeah, I certainly do. You know, that's definitely a regret. And, and I really regret her, you know, the last time her seeing me in person, that I was such a disappointment. That was uh, that's really something I've I've had to struggle with. How do you get past yeah. that? How do you overcome something like that? You you never fully get past that. Um, my sister, um, my sister always lived with my mom. My sister was born with cerebral palsy, so she has some mobility issues. So I live with my sister now, and I I help her out as much as can and we help each other you know so i think you know like i said you know and like people told me the only way you can prove yourself that you've changed is through living differently and being a different person and doing the right thing now that you're 
have the chance to. So I always wanted to show my mom through a living amends that, hey, this is the guy I am now. I'm doing this and by doing things for her and by helping around the house and doing doing things differently. So I feel like, you know, if it's any tribute to my mom, it's it's by helping my sister and, and doing the right thing now. Yeah. I can't imagine how hard that could be, like, to have a parent pass while you're in prison and, and to be on that, you know, not having that closure with them, especially because they saw you the way you were before prison. Yeah, she was, so she died of cancer. And she, um, you know, I got got the call one day to go down to the sally port and one of the sergeants was sitting there and he's like oh yeah your mom is in the hospital it's almost time so they she was she was unconscious but they put her on the phone and they they let me talk and i i said what i had to say and it was it was really tough but you know i i tried to give her every bit of love and encouragement that I was going to do the right thing and that she didn't need to stick around or worry about my sister or, or anything. And, and my aunt, who was actually in the room at the time, said there was a, a noticeable difference in her reaction, even though she was unconscious. And uh, a day or so later, she passed away. There was no option for you to go to the hospital? They didn't offer you that at all? Yeah, there was, if you had the money, you could go have them oh, take you for, for like an hour. I didn't have the money, though, you know. And it was it was like an hour that they would drive you. And I was very scared of the, I didn't want to have that one image of my mom be my last one of her. I don't know if that's very selfish. Sure it is, but I didn't get the chance to see her in person yeah well i'm sorry to hear that man oh thanks <laughs> it's uh it is what it is you know it's it's another nail in the we don't want to follow that path absolutely you know? were there because you were in new jersey were there a lot of uh, mobsters in there at all so when i was sitting at that table one of the older gentlemen uh, italian guy named marco had been in there for 20 something years and was doing 30 to life. Uh, Marco was from Newark, New Jersey. Um, he may have had some ties um, to something that was a bit bigger than what I've ever been involved with. And, uh, you know, Marco was a Catholic guy as myself. He kind of took me under his wing, took me to a Catholic mass got me involved in like Buddhist studies and, and meditation and uh, would take me out and play pinochle with me. And he kind of took me under the wing and, uh, you know, showed me how to navigate um, prison, you know, effectively. Because <laughs> there's ways to do it and there's ways to not. In northern states, a place like you can jail, like if you need bleach or you need tomatoes or you need onions – that can all happen if you know how to work it. So Marco kind of showed me. He also showed me, you know, that uh, life goes on. Um, he was very wise, very influential, and he had, uh, had a posse of other Italian guys. It, it helped that my name ends in a vowel, that uh, I was also Italian probably. But, yeah, Marco um, wa was very influential and helped uh, – Helped me out a lot in prison. They probably had a lot of pull in there, too. You know, and even with the guards, they were respected. Like, you know, there was, I don't know, like they're enamored by that lifestyle. I think a lot of people still are. Um, but, yeah, Marco had a lot of pull. He actually also was like the head of something called the mentor program, which was older guys, gangbangers, gangsters, who would share their stories and, you know, with the younger guys coming in, you know, hey, you know where I'm going to be this Christmas? I'm not going to be with my family. I'm going to be here with you schmucks, you know. That's not cool. There's nothing cool about that. I know you think you're going to get out there again and you're going to be slinging the dope. This is where you're going to be in 30 years if you keep it up. And they actually got, they got guys to drop their flags 
Like they they changed lives this this mentor program and Marco uh, Marco's home now. Oh, have you yeah. guys connected? Yeah, we we've connected and we're we're in the process of maybe writing a story about our our intersection our intersecting journey throughout the the prison system. That's awesome. Is he older or younger? Yeah, he's um he's in his mid to later seventies. What was one thing that you found interesting that he taught you on how to navigate prison life? You know, well, there was so much, but I'm just going to share one thing. So, you know, you go out to the yard, and I was very concerned. You know, you go out to the yard, and you're doing the pull-ups, and you're doing the dips. They they wouldn't give us weights because this is northern state. People are getting hit over the head with the weights there if you had them. And so I'm out there and I'm doing whatever I can, cardio at the time, you know. I know I don't look like it, but I did at the time. And and Marco's like, yeah, you know, that's good for you, but let me show you something else. Well, he starts doing yoga. And, and I'm like, oh, well, that looks kind of cool. So me and Marco are now doing yoga in the middle of the yard while all these guys are doing, like, weights, and they got their books tied around their waist to give them extra resistance and on the pull-up bar. And he, he starts teaching me yoga. And uh, yeah, I know this sounds like the strangest thing to hear in state prison, but it was like we were on this island, and nobody, like, said boo. Nobody said nothing. And I would, like... This was like the best thing I learned. Like it's it's helped me now, even even at my age. Like I I can bend over and touch the floor, you know. I've, limber. Um, he took me to a a Buddhist retreat that they had, where it was like three days of meditation that they allowed you know other people from the outside to come in. So he got me on like a spiritual path while I was there. That that just uh, really turned me around. As far as navigating in prison, you know, he taught me who to talk to to get the uh, fresh produce brought to my cell. <laughs> who do I talk to to get, you know, if I needed hard-boiled eggs, you know, how to negotiate the price that I need it. What they use know. for the currency to exchange to get that stuff? Commissary, of course. A lot of times, depends where you are. So if you're in the main area, it's stamps. A lot of times it's stamps. But of course, pouches go for uh, good money too. Tuna pouches. A lot of people use the mac, the mackerel pouches. The mackerel. I mac. think you're the first state guy that said that they've had the mackerel. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Like, that, that's a Fed thing. Oh, um, yeah. Jack Mac. Yeah. Yeah. That, Jack Mac's a spicy one, right? I think so. Yeah. It's a flavored. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So we had the mac. Uh, you know what? In the whole time I was down there, I never ate, what did they call them? The buns? Honey bun? Honey bun. I never ate one honey bun. Yeah, they're good. You're probably going to live many more years yeah. <laughs> because you don't, a guy would eat a one of those a day. Sometimes two. That's literally your calorie yeah, count that you're, you're supposed done. to intake. Yeah. Those things are, oh man, they just slow you down. Yeah. And any type of those pastries and stuff, like I always feel like shit if I have one of those. Yeah. Crazy. I even tried to eat healthy you know, when I was in prison. <laughs> it's like, hard, man. It's it hard because everything's just loaded in sodium too. And what are you going to do? Ooh. I was pork was also a kitchen runner too, so he'd come back with like bags of apples, bags of lettuce, and I, I'd make salad with homemade uh, homemade dressing. How do you guys make we, dressing? Um, so it depends on the ingredients you get. You know, you get a couple ketchup pouches, you get a couple mayonnaise pouches, get a, some fresh garlic from the kitchen, crush up the garlic, salt, pepper. You know, throw in a little. What's what's the one spice that they always adobo got? or sazon? Sazon, yeah. So popular. It's so popular. That is such a great spice to cook it really with, though. Is. You could put. I put on my rice now. Yeah. You mix it up. It just it makes everything taste good. Put on steak, chicken, yeah, anything. It's just incredible. Of course, you know we're using the stingers to cook down the onions. We had this one cop like on Sunday. I would I would cook down the onions and then I chop up tomatoes and we'd make some pasta and and cop would be like, well, you're making fucking Sunday sauce in there? Come on, man. Put the shade on it. The cop, the sergeant's going to be there. Through. It would stink up the whole place. But, you know, like Northern Northern State, you could jail where you get sent some places. You know, you're not cooking in your cell. You're not getting bleach. You're not doing laundry in your cell, you know. Yeah. At least this was absolutely. a place you could live. Absolutely. Yeah. So what year did you get out? I got out in 2020 
uh, out of the halfway house. And uh, that's during the height of COVID. Now in, in Jersey, um, so I, I get to the halfway house. And since, like, as I'm in, in, in prison, I'm, I'm taking college classes. And they, they're like, oh, if you get to the halfway house, you can start going to college on the outside, like leave for the day, go to college. So I get to the halfway house in January and I get to go to college and I go out and I start the first semester. And in March, boom, COVID shuts it down. And that was it. Like we we're 277 guys living on top of each other in the halfway house. COVID's already in the building and like people were dropping like flies. Like they shut down the college. Everybody's getting sick. They're taking guys back to prison. They're never coming back. By the time I left the halfway house, there was less than a hundred of us left. Um, but the governor gave us emergency credits and took a, six months off my sentence. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you got to get out of there quicker. Yeah. And then what did you do when you got home? What was Did you have a job? So I finished my associate's degree. In, in prison? Um, no, I finished it transferring when I got out. Okay. So, um, and I also published a couple books. Once you got out? you Yeah, well, when I, I, I had this dream when I was in prison. Like I, I, I always wanted to write a book. And I always wanted to be an author, but I never had that gumption to pursue it. And once I started taking the college classes, it reignited my love for literature. It reignited my love for writing. And I started reading everything I could. I started writing. And I'm like, well, this isn't bad. And I started giving it to other guys on there. And they're like, this, this is pretty good. And I'm like, you know what? When I, and they're in composition notebooks. I'm like, so I got this plan. When I get out, I'm going to transfer everything onto a computer. I'm going to edit it to my the best of my ability, and I'm going to try to get published in a couple of magazines. So I do that as soon as I get out. And uh, within about two months, I get accepted into a magazine. Oh, wow. And like a month later, I get another story in a magazine. And then then I won a contest for, for best story. And... Uh, I'm like, well, maybe I could do this. And, and so I submitted a very short uh, novella, 50-page book to a publishing company, and they jumped on it, and they, they published it. And um, you know, since right now I have like eight books out, I've opened my own publishing company, and um, it's been a life-altering experience. I, I'm doing book tours. I'm doing conventions where I... Uh, get to sell my books, meet people who've actually read my books. <laughs> and um, last year I came out with a, a short story collection that a lot of the stories were written while I was in the prison system in the halfway house or in the cell. And it's, it's based on life experiences. It's based on things that's happened to me, but also horror because I'm a horror writer. Um, and it became a number one bestseller on Amazon. That's incredible, man. It's, it was very surreal. Yeah. Well, congratulations to all your success on that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. That's uh, what. What's next for you? Like, what's the five year plan? The five year. So, this uh, this year, I have a four book series, which I wrote a four book series during the lockdown of COVID, and that um, it's a very big epic project. And that's all coming out this summer. So I'm doing this summer, I'm doing a book tour for the four book series. It's called the Ocean Ox, which is a creature feature set very much. It's very much takes like uh, the idea of the thing um, meets, meets Stephen King's The Stand. It takes place in 1979. It's very old school creature feature horror. So I'm going to be doing a, a little book tour for that trying to sell my wares and get more people to to know about it. And I just signed a contract on a another book that uh, I got an advance for that I'm just finishing up right now with a, another author who lives in Australia. So that book's coming out. Um, five years, I don't really like to plan that far in advance. <laughs> no, that's totally yeah. fair. I, I, I've got this year down, and then I'm like, all right, let's see what happens after that. Um, but, yeah. 
you know, I can I can wrap my head around what's going to happen this year, and I've got all my books, my dates booked uh, into December. Uh, well, let's see what happens after that. Um, my uh, my future plans are is to write my story uh, about how somebody who comes from Middle America can fall victim to the opiates, can throw it all away, can end up in a place like Northern State Prison, align with some heavy hitters and the gangs and uh, and maybe the intersection of, of their stories in my book and how we can all come out and use our own stories to help help other people. That's something I'd really like to do. I'd like my... I'd like the story of what's happened to me be able to maybe just change one or two people's lives and maybe redirect them or at least give them hope that, you know, hey, when you get through that, here, here's some of the things you could do. That's awesome, man. Well, That'd I'm very cool. excited to, to hear that. And I'm very excited that you've, you know, you've gone through all these horrible things, but you were able to turn it all around and, and there was a light and it brought you to where you're supposed to be and you have your purpose now. I think you know, it's so important to have purpose in life and you were able to find that. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for sharing your story with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is, I talked your ear off, but uh, no, yeah, no, this you, has been great. Yeah. No, uh, everyone, like some people are like, oh, I, you did most of the talking, like referring to yourself as the guest and that's the way it should be. You know, it's a chance for you to tell your story. No one would listen to us if I just talked about <laughs> me the whole time and tell stories, you know? Well, we like your story too. Yeah, yeah I mean, but I, I chime like in, you know, and, and that, and I just guide the person, you know? I give people uh, an opportunity to share their to their story, and I think that's uh, I think that's important. That's my purpose. So we all have our purpose in life, and that's what I'm on. Well, if anything, I, I've given the audience a, a view of what uh, – some of the dumbest criminals in the world have done to to get into prison. <laughs> and uh, if, if we stand out for anything, we'll, we'll stand out for that. Sure.